Good morning, everyone. Good, to, good morning, Mrs. Thomas. <laughs> Thank you for coming back. We have our final session here today. And I am telling you, I'm going to really miss this class. This has just been so much fun, and you've all been so faithful. We've just seen you Sunday after Sunday. And uh, in fact, what Eveline was saying here today, she wished she had have thought of it earlier, but we could have had a, uh, a class dinner uh, up in Christ, Christwood. Is that what you were saying? Krista, up at Krista. So that's something we're going to put in the hopper for after the next class, which starts in April. That's going to be April 18th, and it'll go through the 23rd. So perhaps after that class, that'll give you uh, something to think about for coming back for. The next class is going to be wonderful. It's going to be some study right out of Luke. It's going to be led by Dave Rohr, who is you know, has just a, the kind of teaching that just goes so deep, and he will come up with things you didn't ever dream of. Uh, but we're going to be studying especially the characters in Luke uh, surrounding John the Baptist. So he's going to really dig in there, and he's going to teach us some things about picking up the cues for what God might be doing in your life and how to look for those things through these uh, people in the Bible. So this will be in the study of Luke. Uh, it'll be a powerful time of learning. So you want to make sure that gets on your calendar and then be thinking a little bit about if you want to, to have a little party at the end of that. It'll be the end of your party for us. Uh, today is the last day to sign up for small groups. And I know you are all very much aware that this is going on because we've been talking about it in this class. Also, you've been hearing about it in the worship services for many weeks. Today's the last day. Uh, some of you have said, I really, really want to be a part of a group, but it's just not working out for me. There's nothing in my neighborhood. I can't drive. I have these parameters. In order to make sure that no one misses out on this small group experience, I want to suggest two possibilities that may work for you. One is on Wednesday mornings. Throughout Lent, there is a worship service that starts at 645 and ends at 730. At 730, you're invited to participate in this small group if you're interested uh, with Marianne Hagen back here and a group that will, she'll be facilitating that uh, with, uh, so, well, with Mary Vincent, yes. So that would be right after that morning worship service. You slide into Knox, you can have that small group experience in there. Now, that's kind of early in the morning for some of you. I've also heard that uh, there's at least one person uh, who is really saying, this is the only time in my life is at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. So if that's working for you and you say that would be the only time that would accommodate me for a small group, we're going to have a small group in this room going through this material that you've been seeing. That's another option for you. It will be facilitated also by Mary Ann Hagen, who will be so much an authority by the time she gets through with this series. That's a possibility. Now, if there was just like everybody said, oh, that's a great thing, I'll do that, we'd need more than one round table, and then we'd need more facilitators. So someone else in here would also need to say, I'd be glad to facilitate, and then we'd need to get you lined up with that. All of the groups that are meeting have to be registered and so you'll see up here that we have a computer. And Gretchen Harrell will come in after the, she's finished in choir at the end of this class. And she will help you get signed up if you would like to. She can also help you find a group in your neighborhood if you're interested in that. And that's the experience that George is hoping that you will opt for, is that you will find a way to take your group out into the community. He wants to see UPC represented in communities all throughout Seattle. So if that's of interest to you, please stick around at the end of the afternoon hour and we can be talking a little bit more about how to get you involved in a small group so you don't miss out on anything. Today we're getting ready for our final class. Let's pray to think it through. Lord, thank you for, uh, for clearing our minds, for opening our hearts and our ears. Lord, I am so grateful for the study of First and Second Samuel. The things that we have learned over the last 18 weeks have just filled us up with reminders that you are involved in our lives, that you have prepared us for the time that we live in right now, and the things that we can learn through King David and through the people that he served. Lord, these are examples for us 
Uh, They come out of a different century, a different time. But, Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus Christ. We thank you for the grace that we experience, for the resource of the Holy Spirit. And we ask that it be alive and well in us today. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A quick review of where we have been. This is 2 Samuel. This is the last four chapters of 2 Samuel. We don't know who the author of this book was. It wasn't Samuel. He may have contributed, but we know that he died halfway through 1 Samuel, so it couldn't be him. Uh, There have been other compilers of this information, perhaps during the exile. Uh, Probably some of the contributors would have been Nathan, prophet to David, and Gad, also a prophet. The time of the writing would have been sometime around 1100 B.C. in the early part where we first met Hannah. That lasted about 100 years. King David came to the throne about 960 B.C. Did I say A.D.? 1100 B.C. to 1000 B.C. was 1 Samuel. And then 2 Samuel 960 for the 40 years that David reigned. Uh, The purpose of the writing of 2 Samuel is to focus on the reign of David. He comes to the throne at the very beginning of this. The key verse in 2 Samuel is 2 Samuel 7, 16, because this is where the Davidic covenant is established. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is where we see Jesus Christ in 2 Samuel, because you'll find this reiterated in Luke Uh, chapter 1, where the angel says to Mary, he says that she's going to have this baby. He announces he will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Christ is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He's the Son of God in the line of David, and he reigns forever and ever. I got very interested in the genealogy of Jesus and went back to the accounts in Matthew and in Luke to see if we could make them all come together. Uh, Very, very interesting. What I learned in that process is that Mary and Joseph were actually cousins, and so that was not an unusual thing in that era, uh, but it's a really fascinating thing, and I've got, I printed something out, I didn't bring it in, but um, if you're interested, let me know, and I can email it to you, but just this whole thing on the, on the genealogy of Jesus. So in brief, the summary is this, Second Samuel has these kind of three sections. The first ten chapters deal with his triumphs, and how he was really a hero in that part. And then we see the troubles of him between chapter 11 and chapter 20. And then the last part of the book, which is chapters 21 through 24, are kind of an appendix. It's not so much things that we can just shuffle in chronologically, but it's more like, oh, by the way, (laughs) by the way, these things also happened and they are significant to David's reign. So the book begins, you'll remember, with the death of Saul and his sons, although there was one son that remained. But David proclaims a time of mourning, and then soon after that, he's crowned the king of Judah. Meanwhile, Ishbosheth, who is one of Saul's remaining sons, uh, has been crowned the king of Israel by the commander of Saul's army, Abner. That goes badly. He doesn't stay king for long. After he's murdered, the Israelites ask David to be king over them as well. And that happens in chapters 4 and 5. Then uh, David moves the capital from Hebron, which is sort of down in the part of Judah, up to Jerusalem, which is more in the center of the nation. Uh, He also brings back the Ark of the Covenant, and he plans to build a temple. And you'll remember that that's when God said to him, that you're not going to build a temple for me. I'm building a dynasty for you, and that's where we get the Davidic covenant. So things are going pretty well. It's sort of interesting, though, at that point where he says, it's not your job to build the temple. It's it's almost as if David goes, 
it's not my job. I'll go back to battle. And so he goes out and he does what he does best, and that's that he conquers people. <laughs> so we see that he, uh, he goes over the enemy nations. He takes on Edom, Moab, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Amalekites, and he's victorious in all, the, all of those battles. But he also so, shows kindness to the family of Jonathan by taking in Mephibosheth. This is his son that is lame, and he says he will always have a place at his table. So the first ten chapters go fairly well. Then we get to chapter 11, and David has a moral fall. And you will remember that he lusts for a beautiful woman named Bathsheba. Uh, He commits adultery with her, and then he conspires to eliminate her husband, and he has him murdered. Uh, Nathan the prophet comes to him and says confronts him with his sin. Uh, David confesses. We see that God forgives him, but he does give the caveat. David would have trouble within his own household. And boy, does he have trouble in his house. His firstborn son, Amnon, rapes his half-sister, Tamar. In retaliation for that, Tamar's brother, Absalom, kills Amnon. Absalom flees Jerusalem because he fears for his life Uh, when his father finds out. He stays away for a while, uh, and he manages to come back and be forgiven by David. But later, he leads a revolt against David, and some of David's former associates join that rebellion. All of that happens in chapters 15 and 16. And in the course of that, David is forced out of Jerusalem. And Absalom sets himself up for king for a short time. But then this usurper is overthrown and David is drawn back. But it isn't until after Absalom is killed, which is a a tremendous grief and tragedy for David. After this, there is just a general feeling of unrest that plagues the remainder of David's reign. So what had started off so hopeful and so bright has turned out to be full of tragedy and full of conflict. The covenant remains, however. So the books that we're studying today, chapters 21, 22, 23, and 24, uh, like I say, they're kind of also ran, ran chapters. We can't place them exactly chronologically in the course of the second Samuel. So we just have to assume that they are important because the person that has written this has said, you need to know these things. Let's begin here with second Samuel 21. Now, there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, The Lord said, There is blood guilt on Saul and on his house because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had tried to wipe them out in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. The covenant that was made with them, the oath that was made to them, happened when Joshua was coming in to the promised land. And as he came in, these people, under a great deception, came to him. And in fact, they were nearby neighbors. They had lived uh, close by in the Amorite region. But they came bearing... uh, horrible clothes. They had brought in stale bread and said, look, we've been on the road for so long. Our bread is all stale. Our our wine is almost gone. And they looked pretty tragic. Joshua asked, he said, you know, are you sure you're not nearby neighbors? And they said, oh, no, no, we've come from a long way. Give us a place in Israel. So he said, okay. The problem with that was he forgot to inquire of the Lord. So Joshua made an oath with these people that they could live peacefully among them. Uh, When he found out that he had been tricked, he went back to them and said, you've tricked us. And then he makes them subservient to Israel. When I first read this a number of years ago, this just irked me no end to think, so we have to hold good to a promise that we made under such deception. Shows how faithful I would be to a promise to you if you did something wrong to me, I guess. But uh, that's the way oaths were managed. 
You make an oath. You stand by it to the end. Well, I might be more like Saul than I think because uh, he was a very zealous man, and we know that he was obsessed. Uh, But it's sort of interesting. Uh, We wonder, perhaps, if this episode took place at Nob when Saul came in and killed all of the priests. There was a whole community of priests, and there was a horrible massacre there when Saul thought that they had supported David while he was on the run. That's where he got the sword of Goliath. Ahimelech, the priest, gave him the bread off of the altar to feed him. Saul did not believe that he wasn't aiding and abetting the enemy, and so he slaughtered the whole community. Well, the Gibeonites served that community. They were part of the uh, servant uh, layer there, and they provided for the community of priests there. So there's a possibility that Saul wiped them out in that episode. And we're not sure because it's not noted anywhere else in the Bible, this particular massacre, which is really interesting. It finds its source in this appendix of material. But uh, apparently it really happened, and we don't have all of the details, but I thought that was a pretty good theory. The thought that the blood guilt could cause a famine in the land is also a foreign concept to us because we're 21st century people. That just doesn't make sense to us that it would be connected to something that happened there. But these are an ancient people. They didn't have uh, weather satellites to predict when things were going to happen or to check in on things. It's not at all unreasonable for them to associate this famine in the land with some sort of national guilt. And the idea that they might be responsible, perhaps the Hebrews did nothing to stop this onslaught against these people, or perhaps they participated in it. Uh, But there's a possibility that there's some national sin and that this famine is a result of that. David said to the Gibeonites at verse 3, What shall I do for you? How shall I make expiation that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, It's not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house. Neither is it for us to put anyone to death in Israel. He said, What do you say I should do for you? They said to the king, The man who consumed us and planned to destroy us so that we would have no place in all the territory of Israel, let seven of his sons be handed over to us, And we will impale them before the Lord at Gibeon on the mountain of the Lord. The king said, I will hand them over. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, because of the oath that the Lord had made between them, between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Rizpah, daughter of Aiah, whom she bore to Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, that's a different Mephibosheth, Can you imagine that that's a common name? (laughs) (laughs) Kind of like Paul, you know, (laughs) Randy, no. Uh, And the five sons of Merab, daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the Mahalathite, and gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they impaled them on the mountain before the Lord. The seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of the harvest, at the beginning of the barley harvest. The two sons of Rizpah were Saul's sons. The sons of Merab would be his daughter, so those would be his grandsons. I put a couple questions there. Why do you think David would agree to that? And then also a little bit of a follow-up question. What did the death of Saul's sons mean for David? Do you have any thoughts on those things? Why would he agree to this? So Midori is suggesting that if, if you kill off all of the successors, you know, you've taken care of the whole problem. That sort of went through my mind, too. You extinguish the line. Right. It's really interesting. I think he was more concerned about the famine, that he thought if, if, if this was if this sort of ritual punishment of Saul's family or Good point. It, he was concerned about the famine. This was, he rules the country. He needs to look out for the people that are there. So I found that, I found that really interesting as well. It's the end of the line for, 
for the for Saul's family as far as this event is concerned. Uh, blood guilt was something else that I just found interesting. Now that has to be that's when someone sheds blood unjustly, and actually David was guilty of that with Uriah the Hittite. Yes. Well, I think it's interesting in the beginning of the passage it said that the famine uh, had gone on and that David consulted the Lord and the Lord said there's not blood guilt. He told him how it was that there was that high guilt. So it was revealed to David that it was blood guilt. This is what's going on. So, so he goes to the people in the Gibeonites and says, well, how, how can this be resolved? And their solution is the question. The Gibeonites didn't come to him. He went to them and said, what's going on here? Don? Uh, providing an atonement for he, for breaking of that oath. Good point. Don? Well, I, just on that one, I, do you think he could have been saying, we dishonored the name of God in which we established this covenant? Yes. To correct that because otherwise people would say we're not honoring our God, we're making a claim. Right. Right, it was for the reputation of Israel. If we say we honor God and God says you have made an oath, then to break that, is, it not only dishonors God, it just sort of it destroys your reputation that we are not trustworthy people. Good point. Let's move on to Rizpah. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah, took sackcloth and spread it on a rock for herself from the beginning of harvest until rain fell on them from the heavens. She did not allow the birds of the air to come on the bodies by day or the wild animals by night. Rizpah, to me, is one of the most lovely characters in all of 2 Samuel. She is a concubine. This sent me on such a journey while I was getting ready for this class about concubinage. It's such an interesting phenomenon. It's something that was definitely allowed uh, during its time. It wasn't forbidden. Uh, Sometimes a concubine was a part of the booty. If you had conquered an enemy, you would take their wives. Those wives would be essentially servants. Sometimes they served as secondary wives. They certainly did not have the honor of a first wife or someone that was chosen. And in fact, sometimes the children of these slave women would be given to the the real wives of the person that uh, has the concubines. They are, when you think of it, they have no choices in their world. They are at the mercy of the person who owns them. And so there would be, on the part of Rizpah, there would be nothing she could do when they say, uh, we need your sons to be to pay for this debt. She had no voice in that whatsoever. We remember Rizpah also from earlier when Abner was accused of sleeping with Saul's concubine, and this would be Rizpah. He did not admit or deny that, but it's the issue over which Ishbosheth lost his life. So she played a role in that. Uh, there's more on the concubines. As David puts the ten concubines, his concubines, uh, in under house arrest, Uh, after Absalom has slept with them, which is really an interesting point, too. And there's some very interesting commentary on that. I wish we could go into it about what that might have been like and what it might have meant. Because David uh, changed things a bit there once he put them, once he locked them up under house arrest. They lived as widows, and and that had some implications. I also just want to comment on Rizpah's act here. This was such an act of motherly devotion. I mean, she, she went not only her children, but the grandchildren of Mirab. She took a sackcloth and threw it out over a rock. It doesn't say she had a tent. So she was out there in the heat of the day, in the cold of the night, making sure that the birds didn't come on the, and peck away at the bodies, that the wild animals at night didn't come close. She so honored uh, these bodies so she, was, she just was really an amazing woman. Verse 11. When David was told that Rizpah, daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, what she had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the people of Jabesh-Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Bethshan, 
where the Philistines had hung them up on the day the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. He brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who had been impaled, and they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin in Zelah, in the tomb of his father Kish. They did all that the king commanded. After that, God heeded supplications for the land. So what changed in David? Rizpah's act. It's almost like it flipped a switch in him. Seems like there was a new compassion in him that had come. Again, we don't know exactly the timing of this event, but I can't help but wonder if there was, that David might have been in some sort of a depression, possibly at the death of his son and then another attempt at the throne by Sheba just in the chapter before this. If it's, if it's chronological at all, we don't know that it is. Could be some of that going on. But I do think, I think with you that, uh, that he saw Rizpah's response. And so he just, it just reminded him of the compassionate person that he was. Midori? You know, it's just like people that keep, they keep certain laws. Yes. And that's to remind the others that don't do it. Mm-hmm. That there's something <laughs> That's a great explanation. There is a, a sense of tradition in what should happen, how things should go here. And David noticed that again. It, it was refreshed for him. It's a really good point. I like it that Rizpah here, a concubine, just talk about a marginalized person, which is what David's reign has always been about, about marginalized people. We've remembered that. But here she is really on the margins of things. She's mentioned and honored in this passage. And look at us 3,000 years later saying what an amazing woman she was. What what an honor. Can you imagine anyone saying something of you 3,000 years later that was so honoring? Well, I think it also fits with the way that David had uh, respected the kingship. Yes. And this was kind of the final respect for Solomon's and the family, the, the last, really paying his last respects when he gave them a proper burial. That's a good point, Anna Joyce. Okay, uh, let's move on to verse 16 here. <clears throat> the Philistines went to war again with Israel, and David went down together with his servants. They fought against the Philistines, and David grew weary. Ishbi Benob one of the descendants of the giants whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze and who was fitted with new weapons said he would kill David. But Abishai, son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, you shall not go out with us to battle any longer so that you do not quench the lamp of Israel. What's this going to do for David's role? He's always been the warrior. He's always led in battle. How will this change? Go ahead. He, he, I bet he's, he must be nearing 70. If he's toward the end of his reign, he reigned for 40 years, and he took the throne at 30. So, of course, we don't know exactly when this is chronologically, but he probably is not a young man right now. Well, in U.S. history, retired generals become presidents. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, we, we're pretty sure he wasn't playing golf. I don't think it had been invented yet. <laughs> but his role is going to change. I think it's interesting that Abishai comes to his rescue, and, of course, this is his nephew, but he's always been impetuous. He's always been very helpful, but a little bit overzealous. And I remember when they had uh, found Saul and camped, he wanted to go down and kill him. There he is. Let's get him. And David wouldn't allow him to do that. He always had to be held back a little bit. We have to restrain this young man. Uh, But aren't we glad that he was there and that he was able to step up and say, you know, I I can take this one for you. So the, the men are faithful and they are solidly with David. And they are and he's with them as well. But he says, you're not going out again. I think he still had a role, like you said, Don. I think he probably is a strategist. I think he has seen enough of the land, enough of the enemy to say, 
I can lead from off-site. I think it's also interesting to note, unlike other kings, where, where the king accepted uh, the credit for every victory, David shares credit. He's an amazing leader. Uh, it's not like he's saying, I did it all myself. He's perfectly contented to say, I've surrounded myself with great people. And that's something I love to see in a leader, a leader who says, I could not have done this without these people, and then naming them. Well, let's go back just a little bit about keeping the light shining. We know that in the temple, the light had to stay burning in Israel. So the, light, the lamp burned continually in the tabernacle. It was a symbol of God's presence with them. David is a symbol for his men. He is the contact with God. He's the one who inquires of the Lord and says, here's what God has said to do. To do. And so they recognize that and they say, if something happens to you, the light goes out in Israel. We need you to be our leader. So it's just this great uh, sense of respect and mutual reliance that's just beautiful. After this, a battle took place, this is verse 18, with the Philistines at Gob. Sebekie, a Hushathite, killed Saph, who was one of the descendants of the giants. Then there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob, and Elhanan, son of Yerihahi Oregim, <laughs> the Bethlehemite, uh, killed Goliath. This was also a common name, so it's not the same Goliath. Uh, the Gittite, uh, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. There was again a war at Gath, where, the, where there was a man of great size who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. He too was descended from the giants. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of David's brother, Shammai, killed him. So that's another nephew of David. These four were descendants from the giants of Gath. They fell by the hands of David and his servants. And just again, a note that there were many heroes that carried on here. Uh, let's go over to uh, chapter 22 verses 1 through 51. This is a very famous psalm. It's also Psalm 18. Very few little changes between this and Psalm 18. Uh, a great psalm of thanksgiving. I might kind of be rushing through it a little bit here. I do want you to know that I cover in detail Psalm 22 in Pray the Word. I cover it over six days, starting, I think, Next Friday, I'm not sure if you remember where it is, Al, but I think it starts next Friday and it goes for six days. Um, and there's more on Pray the Word as well over the things that we've just covered. So we're going to continue through Pray the Word to, to follow along with Second Samuel for a little while. And then we'll, we'll move on to something else there as well. Okay, so here we are. Uh, this song is David really, we're pretty sure, toward the end of his life. David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. For the waves of death encompassed me. The torrents of perdition assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. So we're beginning here with these great expressions of deliverance and great confidence in God's response when he calls. Verse 7, in my distress I called upon the Lord to my God, I called. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundation of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. So why do you think God would be angry? I think he's angry because David feels unsafe. I think so, too. I think it's such an incredible response. I love the idea in verse 7 there. He says, I cried out, and my cry came to his ears. And for some reason, I just feel like that is just his prayer raises 
to God, and God hears him. And God was angry. He feels that David was being mistreated. Verse 9, smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him a canopy. Thick clouds a gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundation of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. Here comes the rescue. Verse 17, he reached from on high. He took me. He drew me out of the mighty waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. What does that sound like to you? Does it remind you of anything? Could be Saul. Reminds me a lot of the, of the Israelites coming out in the Exodus and crossing the sea. He drew him out of mighty waters. He talks about um, verse 19. They came upon me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Talk a little bit about what that broad place would be. What do you think that means? What does it mean for you when you say that about yourself? A safe place. A safe place. Without danger. I love those psalms that talk about um, he's drawn the lines for me in pleasant places. I think that's in Psalm 16. I just, there's something about that. There's a boundary on it, but it's a safe place. You are, God has drawn the boundaries for you. And I think here, I feel that in this verse too, that he puts you in a broad place. I've got lots of room to run here. This feels really good, yeah. Well, I, I think also when he's, um, all these things are going on around him and everything, he, you know, you're kind of drawn in, you're scared, you're, you're worried, you're, but then when God rescues you and brings you out, it's like freedom and it's, um, everything opens up. Uh, that's really good. There's a certain sense of being just closed in and almost a claustrophobic sense in that. Or things are around you, so you broaden. Yes, Dick. It calls to mind for me what's going on today in Afghanistan, where our Marines are fighting a very difficult situation. Yes. The Taliban can function as more effectively by being able to hide, and if they had our people had more open space to work with, that would be really interesting idea that we can see this kind of uh, battle tactics even in Afghanistan with our Marines, Dick is saying. Very interesting. Yes, Anna Joyce. Well, it kind of also makes me think of, um, the Bible has a lot of descriptive language. It does, doesn't it? Right. I think we don't think enough about deliverance as well here, and he talks about he, he was delivered because God delighted in him. I, I think we sometimes don't, we don't realize we've been delivered from things. And then you look back and you say, I was so delivered from that. And sometimes it's danger. Uh, sometimes it's a situation. Can you think of a time when you were delivered from something? Say there was no way out. Mm -hmm. Wilma? Those who call upon the name of anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Huh. That's what David was doing, and that's what we do when we come to Christ. We call upon the Lord and so he brings us out and he delivers us from that's the ultimate deliverance yeah. isn't it it is and that we call upon the Lord and he saves us we are delivered we are delivered from hell it's an amazing deliverance yes Suzanne um, a time I remember being delivered I was a probation officer and a woman went berserk and hmm. had me 
be in her house, and I thought she was going to kill me. <gasps> oh. And um, I hadn't been in church for years, but I prayed to God. I said, please, wow. get me out of here alive. And um, she went out, and eventually I got out. <laughs> that it, we can see that. Yeah, <laughs> you are here. <laughs> That, that's really scary stuff where you are really at the, at the mercy of someone else, at the hands of someone else, and that woman was not going to show you any mercy. Crazy. I tried to get out. Yeah. yeah. Boy, you've got some good stories, I bet. Hmm. <laughs> we want to hear more from you. <laughs> Anna Joyce? I'm impressed also that David is saying it's the Lord who did it, and not my battles, my strength. Um, it's, it's something that uh, in all this calamity that you've talked about, He gave, gave the credit to God, which is interesting because right now you're going to see a change of tone. We're going to move here to verse 21. Suddenly it seems like things move a little bit more toward what David has done. He says, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He recompensed me for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God for all his ordinances were before me and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him and I kept myself from guilt. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness according to my cleanness in his sight with the loyal you show yourself loyal. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you show yourself perverse. You deliver a humble people, but your eyes are upon the haughty to bring them down. Isn't that an interesting transition? We go from all of this amazing credit to God, and he says, but, here. And and I have to ask the question, which I put there on your handout, is, you know, how is a person's morality uh, important in the covenant God had with Israel? But is, is morality an important part of our covenant with God today? Say again? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Can you elaborate on that? Well, um, I would say that to God, to find a piece of mind, so to in or to honor god you, you get no peace of mind when you are off the mark so there is maybe a moral part yes dick uh, god expects uh, the israelites to be alike to other people yes Good point. The Israelites are the light. They are the nation with the light to the world. Midori? Well, I, have, I always have a problem with behavior because, you know, I am not perfect and there's no way I can, like, match up to any of them. I mean, I just feel like I wasn't raised that way, raised with all these rules, and, you know, the rules are just hard for me. But I believe, like, when you experience deliverance, part of it is. God provides both a willingness to be somebody that follows the rules, and he also provides the way. The will and the do. I, I love and, that. And, and God takes care of the whole thing. The is that the guilt of not being able to do it on your own, of not being able to do it on your own. And so part of this is, like, it's okay to say, well, I don't know about that. It's okay to... Um, question things because God provides the willingness for you to understand it. That's so good. You know, we, we forget sometimes that, especially under the covenant of grace, God does it all. God does it all. He puts in you to will and to do. He puts it into you to want to do it, and then he provides a way. Where God guides, God provides. I love that little proverb. Verse 29 David returns to kind of a God-centeredness now. He says, indeed, you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord lightens my darkness. By you I can crush a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. That's the name of one of the books that we have included here, A Leap Over a Wall. Sounds a little like Superman. He's faster than a speeding bullet here. Um, 
This God has, uh, his way is perfect. The promise of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who has girded me with strength has opened wide my path. He made my feet like the feet of deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation and your help has made me great. You have made me stride freely and my feet do not slip. I pursued my enemies and destroyed them and did not turn back until they were consumed. I consumed them. I struck them down so that they did not rise. They fell under my feet, for you girded me with strength for the battle. You made my assailants sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, those who hated me, and I destroyed them. They looked, but there was no one to save them. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine like the dust of the earth. I crushed them and stamped them down like the mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with the peoples. You kept me as the head of nations. People whom I I had not known served me. Foreigners came cringing to me. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their strongholds. The Lord lives, blessed be my rock, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me, who brought me out from my enemies. You exalted me above my adversaries. You delivered me from the violent. For this I will extol you, O Lord, among the nations and sing praises to your name. He is a tower of salvation for his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. He reiterates the covenant to David and his descendants forever. Interesting the way this is put together. We've had in in 21, we've seen a little bit of a recap of some of the mighty men who brought down the giants. We have this beautiful poem, this beautiful psalm, There's another short psalm that follows, and we're going to just cover that. And then you'll note that at the end, there's another summary of mighty men. But let's look at this part, the last words of David, it says. But we know that the last words aren't really here. They are in 1 Kings, uh, right around chapter 2. And they aren't nearly as lovely as these, but they do summarize the things. He he says, put this one to death and don't let that one get away, And (laughs) as he's directing Solomon and and, uh, providing some words of wisdom for him. But these are the words that David says about himself. These are the ways he is summarizing his life here at the end. Now, these are the last words of David. The oracle of David, son of Jesse, the oracle of the man whom God exalted, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the favorite of the strong one of Israel. He establishes here a little bit of a messianic identity. So his biology is noted. You'll see that he calls himself the son of Jesse, but he also says he's exalted and anointed by God. He's a favorite son. Some versions say that he is the singer of songs in Israel rather than the strong one of Israel, which is interesting. I like that. But what we do note here is that he's one part Jesse, three parts God. I wonder if I'll be able to say that at the end of my life. I'm one part my genetics in my family, and I'm three parts who God has said I am. Verse 2, the spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His word is upon my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, one who rules over people justly, ruling in the fear of God, is like the light of morning, like the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain of the grassy land. So we note in these verses that David is describing his work. This is his kingly work. And it's who God says he was. He says a king is one who who rules justly. And David was not an oppressive man. Even though he was a great warrior and he struck down many of the enemy, he was a man who ruled with righteousness and justice. Verse 5, Is not my house like this with God? 
For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. Will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? But the godless are like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be picked up with a hand. To touch them, one uses an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, for they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. So he's the bearer of the covenant. These three things, he has this identity. He says what God says about him. He says, I'm the son of Jesse, but God says these things. He talks about his vocation. What, what's his job? What is he to be here on earth? And he talks about the everlasting covenant. I've provided here just a few questions for you to be asking of yourself. David wrote his own words. So who's your earthly family? How has being part of God's family given you confidence in who you are? And how has your anointing with the Holy Spirit informed your sense of purpose? Living in a covenant relationship with God, what does this mean for you? I just find all of those questions so intriguing. And I also know that the next class that we are going to be in with Dave Rohr is going to discuss some of these things. How's your identity shaping your life, and how can you see God's purpose in all of that? We're coming up really close to uh, 11 o'clock. Let's see if we can just kind of race through this. Uh, what you will see here, oh, I know, I probably did this on purpose because there's so many names I can't say. <laughs> but he mentions some really great warriors. Uh, we see here some familiar names that are, you're, you're glad that you see them. Uh, people like Abishai gets a special place of honor. He was a, a leader among them. He wasn't considered some of the, one of the three mighty ones, uh, but he has a place among them. There's this, these verses uh, 13 through 17. I'm going to just read through those because they're very telling. Towards the beginning of harvest time of the 30 chiefs went down to to join David at the cave of Abdullam, while the band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Raphim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gate. Then the three warriors broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and brought it to David, but he would not drink of it. He poured it out to the Lord, for he said, The Lord forbid that I should do this. Can I drink the blood of the men who went to risk their lives, at the risk of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. The three warriors did these things. It's just so interesting to see this right in the middle of this. A great sacrifice. What a great sacrifice that he made. If you look on here, you'll go through the scripture. You'll see some questions that can help you finish up your study here as well. There's somebody missing in this list, and I won't make you try and find it out, but Joab is not listed in this list. And Joab has been with him as the commander of his army forever. And I'm curious about that. I'm not sure why he's not counted in there. Eugene Peterson, who is kind of has some interesting remarks, thinks that Joab's name was removed from the list, and we don't know exactly why, but there's something for you to look at. Look at that list. Go back and review where Joab has been really important to him. He's also a very bloodthirsty guy. There's this great regret that David has when he orders the people to be counted. God stirred him up to do that, it says. Over in Second Chronicles, you'll see that Satan uh, provoked him to count his men. And he did this. Uh, he found that there were 800,000 soldiers who were able to draw the sword in verse 9. Uh, Joab takes this count, and Joab tells him, don't do it. God doesn't want you to do this. It's wrong. We shouldn't be doing it. Why do you think it would be wrong to take a census? Maybe he would count more on those men than on God. He knew he was strong and manpower. All right. And he, I think that's the reason, too, that it was a sin. I had to read that over and over again. We're taking a census now, you know, but uh, they are, I think it was that he was putting his trust in the wrong things. So you might want to go back and take a look at that. But what I saw in this was that he was absolutely grief stricken that he had done this. Anyway, it is 11 o'clock and we need to conclude, but you got some things to think about. Isn't that interesting? 
Yes, he's one that was killed, and there's another one at the beginning. Amasa was also killed, but those are the mighty men. Do you have any concluding comments, and then we'll pray, and I'll hang around if you want to chat. We've got our setup up here, Gretchen. You're going to help get people signed up who would like to be a part of a small group. Yes, Roberta. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful, wonderful class. Thank you. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together, and we just pray that you will bring to life Scripture as we read it on our own for the next six weeks and as we participate in small groups. Lord, bless us and keep us. Let us be your servants, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.